Yesterday, as Archbishop was celebrating the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, on the top balcony, there were a bunch of actors and actresses who were preparing for the show um, later last night, and, and it was just very distracting uh, for, for me. I'm sitting up here, and I'm trying to pay attention to worship. At the same time, I see uh, boys and girls like dancing with each other and playing up there, and, and as I was distracted uh, by their uh, rehearsal, um, I was drawn back to a time many years ago when I was in seminary. I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Calcutta in my seminary formation and spend about a month with Mother Teresa's sisters, uh, serving the poorest of the poor, working in their home for the dying and the destitute, and just praying with the sisters. And in the sisters' chapel in their mother house, uh, they don't have an AC, and, and so they keep the windows open so they can have air come in uh, for adoration. But because the windows are open, we hear everything that's happening outside the chapel. And it's chaotic. It is absolutely chaotic. There are people screaming, and there are people cursing. There are people fighting, honking their horns. And as all of this chaos is going on out there, and, and the, the floor is uncomfortable, and it stinks, that the sisters are simply gazing at the face of Jesus and the Eucharist. They're not saying, excuse me, people, we're trying to pray. Can you please like, stop what you're doing to accommodate us and our relationship with Jesus Christ? No, they just focus on their bridegroom. When I was in Calcutta, I would, I would ask all the sisters who knew Mother Teresa personally, tell me about my mother. I feel like she's my spiritual mother and John Paul is my spiritual father. And so I want to know more about my spiritual parents. And, and even now that I'm back home in, in Baton Rouge, a, a few blocks from my inner city parish, we have a, a soup kitchen and a woman's shelter that's run by Mother Teresa's nuns, the missionaries of charity. And so weekly, I'm like a little kid. I ask them, tell me more about mom. I want to hear stories about Mother Teresa. And, and they, they tell me stories. And, and one of the stories that has impacted me the most was a story that one of my friends shared with me. He used to work with Mother Teresa while she was still living. In 1985, she opened up a home for, for men and women who were dying from AIDS. And whenever the AIDS first broke out in America, nobody knew what it was. No one knew how to deal with it. People were, were confused. People were scared. They resisted people who had AIDS. And so Mother Teresa leaned into those who were untouchable. She leaned into those who were seen as even unlovable. She opened this home, and at that time, most of the people who entered this hospice, maybe they lived for a few weeks or just a few months, but they would die shortly after entering this home. One day, a, a young woman came, and she was 20 years old, and she was dying from AIDS. This woman was mad. She was angry. She was filled with wrath. She came in the home cursing and screaming, physically assaulting the sisters who would try to help her. She was mad because when she was just 10 years old, when she was 10 years old, her mother put her on the streets to live as a prostitute, to make money for her drug addiction. And so from the age of 10 to 20, she was used and abused by men and by women for 10 years. And now she's 20 and she's dying from AIDS. She never knew love. She's mad. And every day the sisters would go in and they would love on her and they would bathe her and they would feed her and they would clothe her and they would clip her nails. And every day she would kick them and she would spit on them and she would call them every name under the sun. She was probably their most volatile patient in their hospice. My buddy had to go home for a home visit and when he came back he no longer heard the, the screaming. He no longer heard the cursing, he no longer heard the violence, and so he assumed, but well, she must have passed away, as most people have done since I've been here. And when he asked, when did she pass, one of his coworkers said, well, she, she didn't pass away. Like she, she's in her room right now, very, very peaceful. And he said, what, what happened? How did she go from being the most angry person here to peaceful and peacefully resting in her room? He said, well, that the sisters just kept loving her. And every time she cursed and every time she kicked and every time she fought them, they blessed her. And they continued to tell her, we love you and we're here to serve you. And finally, eventually, one day, she said to the sisters, why? Why are you so good to me? I don't get it. Why are you so good to me? I've cursed at you and I've 
assaulted you. Why do you keep doing this? And they said, because you're Jesus to us. And our God tells us to love Jesus, and so we love you. And this young girl said, if, if that is how your God tells you to treat me, then I want to know your God. And so the sisters began to teach her about Jesus, and they got the priest to come in, and the priest came in the room, and, and he broke open the gospel for her, and he talked about baptism, and he talked about the Eucharist, and she said, well, I want that. And so he, he baptized her, and he confirmed her, and he gave her her first Holy Communion. And upon receiving Holy Communion, she said, and receiving the Eucharist, it was the first time a man came into my life who, who gave me everything and took nothing from me. She was now espoused to Jesus. She was the bride of Christ as the church. One day she was talking to the sisters and she said, Sisters, do you really think God, Jesus, could love a girl like me? And they said, well, he does. Yeah, but do you think he could really, really marry a girl like me? Well, you are his bride. As the church, you are the bride of Christ. No, but, I mean, do you think he would ever let me be a nun? And the sister said, oh, we, we don't know. We don't, we don't know. That's, that's a lot. You're, you're dying right now from AIDS. We, just, we don't know if that's possible. And she said, I really would love to just be a nun. And so the sisters called Mother Teresa. They called her in Calcutta and said, Mother, we have a patient. She is dying. And all she wants is to be a nun. What do we tell her? What do we do? And Mother Teresa said, give her the habit. She died wearing the habit of a missionary of charity sister in the chapel with a smile on her face. She was espoused to Jesus. She wore her habit uh, to remind her of her marital and her intimate spousal relationship with the Lord. And that brought her joy to know that she was seen, she was known, and she was chosen. She was loved. In the midst of all of her stuff, she was loved by her bridegroom. It is important for couples to remember your wedding day. To remember the day that, that you made your vows. I love watching as the bride walks into the church and, and walks down the aisle in her wedding garment and the bridegroom as, the, as he, he looks at his spouse as she's walking toward him. And I say she's walking toward him because she is not walking to him. She is walking toward him so that together they can walk to Jesus. You walk to Jesus with each other whenever you enter into the sacrament of holy matrimony. You walk toward Christ, him. He is our ultimate bridegroom for all of us, the church, priest, religious, married, and single, Jesus. They walk to Jesus, and because they walk to Jesus together, they look at Jesus, and as you look at Jesus, you're able to listen to Jesus because you're looking at Jesus. And what does Jesus Christ say to us when we look at him? He says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Well, we all know he died for the church, but love your wives as Christ loved the church. In today's first reading from the book of Hebrews, it says, It is impossible for God to lie. The word of God, which is inerrant and inspired, infallible, tells us this is what you're supposed to do. That's God's voice speaking to us. We're looking at God. We hear God. He says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And so you look at Christ on the cross to learn how to love as he loves the church. How do you love the church? On his way to being crucified, there are two thieves, Dismas and another man. And the Gospels say at one point, both of the thieves on the, that, that were crucified with them, as they were going to Calvary, were mocking him and cursing him. Dismas also blasphemed the Lord. And then, and then what happened? Jesus, after Dismas curses his, him out and spits on him and mocks him, Jesus says what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus didn't wait for Dismas to say, oh, my bad, Jesus. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I repent. I apologize. No, Jesus unilaterally forgave. 
He forgave before Dismas even said, I'm sorry. And because he forgave him, then Dismas eventually came around. That's how Christ operated throughout his walk toward Jerusalem. People were sick, and they were dying, and they were hurting, and they said, heal us. They wanted something from him. And what did Jesus do? He not only healed them, but then he said, oh, and by the way, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Notice what they never said. They never said, oh, and by the way, we're sorry. We apologize. We ought not wait for an apology before we offer and extend forgiveness because Jesus did not do it on the cross. He offered forgiveness first. He didn't wait for someone to say, I'm sorry, and we don't either. That's how we die to ourselves. That's how we love like Christ. Those sisters, the MC sisters, Mother Teresa's nuns, as they served this woman who cursed them out and spit on them and attacked them, they forgave her unilaterally. Before she said she was sorry, they offered and extended forgiveness. They were so patient with her like Christ is so patient on the cross. He remained on the cross. He was steadfast on the cross. People said, if you're really God, why don't you get off the cross? I'm sure people told the sisters, give up on that woman. Give up on her. She's a lost cause. You don't deserve that. You don't have to put up with her. Kick her out the house. If she doesn't want to be here, send her somewhere else. But they were unwilling to let her go. They remained with her in the midst of her mess, in the midst of her brokenness. They remained faithful to her as Christ remained faithful on the cross, as we are invited to remain faithful to each other. Our friends are going to say, your spouse is never going to have a conversion. You might as well walk away. And you say, no, I must stay because I love my spouse the way that Christ loved the church. And Christ did not give up on the church. He stayed. Jesus on the cross teaches us how to love. Even when he was in pain, even when he was physically suffering and he was rejected by his best friends and he was abandoned and he was denied and betrayed, he continued to focus on the needs of others. Mary, my mother, you need John. John, please take Mary into your home. The sisters certainly had a lot going on in their lives, but they continued to focus on the other. Why? How were they able to do this? Because daily, those sisters spend time in adoration. Daily, those sisters spend time looking at Jesus in the cross, looking at Jesus in the Bible, looking at Jesus in the blessed sacrament. And the fruit of adoration is imitation. If I look at the Lord, if I gaze at the Lord, if I spend time focused on the Lord, then eventually I'm going to imitate the Lord. And we don't do this so that we can see the visible fruit of our spouse having their conversion. In my lifetime, I don't do this so that my spouse can finally come around and acknowledge all the wrong they've done and make it all right. I do this because Christ did it, period. Imitation of Christ. I love because he loved me first. And so I love others. Regardless of what happens, detached from the results, not seeking the visible fruits. When Jesus died for us 2,000 years ago, Peter didn't show up. Peter wasn't there. James wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. And he still died. They didn't have their conversion until after his death. And in many saints' stories, it wasn't until after they passed away that their spouse ended up coming around and having that conversion that they prayed for and they fasted for and they offered up almsgiving for. We must not be attached to, I need to see this happen in my lifetime. I do this because he did it for me first. The Lord is inviting all of us to grow in our capacity to love. And the way that we love our spouses well is the way that those sisters loved their future sister well, who was dying in their home for victims of AIDS. It is simply by prioritizing adoration because the fruit of adoration is always going to be imitation. And if we can love others well as Christ loves us well on earth, then we will be able to abide in relationship with our bridegroom, Jesus. And if we can persevere in abiding in our relationship with our bridegroom, Jesus, on earth, then our bridegroom, Jesus, will give us the greatest grace possible, which is to remain in relationship with Jesus, not only on earth, 
but most importantly, forever in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity.